says there is a time for peace and there is a time for war. This is a time for war. Today is the time for spiritual warfare and America is worth fighting for. America is worth fighting for because the flag that we salute represents more than just a nation. It represents all the freedoms that Jesus died for. Whether you believe in Jesus or follow him or not, you are the recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ and all the freedoms that he won on the cross and gave to us. I want to speak to you about the power of the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It's the power of God to save the world. We're not just pledging allegiance to any old flag. I'm dressed like this for a purpose. That behind our flag represents all the freedoms that God thought was worthy of dying for. Yes. So are you ready for war? Are you ready for warfare? God has equipped you, whether you know it or not. God has made you ready. In Ephesians 6, it talks about putting on the entire armor of God. See, God has already equipped you. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, The weapons of our warfare aren't flesh and blood, but they are powerful, they're spiritual, and they will bring down strongholds. Only the church is equipped to do that. And when I say the church, I'm including Israel. People of faith who put their confidence in God. So my scripture this morning is Isaiah 59, 19. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Now there's two Jewish words for standard. One is N-E-C, Nice. It means a banner or a flag. It says, well, raise the banner in Zion. That means there's an emblem. All the tribes of Israel had a banner or a flag, and they, will, they would raise their banner in time to rally the troops or rally their tribe. It's a flag. It's a pennant. And we just sang about a flag. That's a standard. But I'm talking about a different standard. I'm talking about the standard of Isaiah 59:19. That's N W N U W C. Noose. It means to put the enemy to flight. It's a standard that vanquishes your enemy and drives them off the battlefield. Now that could be through weapons of praise or worship, living out the Ten Commandments, but it's the gospel, and the gospel has to be more than audible. Yes, we have to preach and teach the gospel. The gospel must not only be audible, but we have to live the gospel. Therein, living the gospel is the power to put the enemy to flight. So I'm going to talk about, and I'm not going to dwell, but I'm going to talk about seven evils of our generation. I want to do this to establish a game plan, a plan or a strategy for war. Talk to any general, and they will not go to battle until there's a battle plan. The church has to have a battle plan. There are seven evils of our generation. And the key is to find out what the spiritual root causes are so we can move in the opposite spirit. We go to war by opposing 
spiritual opposition. I'll tell you, I'll tell you right off, um, the root causes of everything I'm going to mention, and I'm only going to mention seven evils of our generation. You'll identify with them, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'll get to the bottom line, I'll give you the bottom line first. The attack on America and the world today is satanic. Yeah. Don't flinch. Don't turn away from it. Face it. It is the devil himself rising up against God and seeking to overthrow this world. The root cause of everything I'm about to mention is satanic. Number one, there is a rise in hatred and division in America and the world. <coughs> no surprise to you. You've seen it coming. It's here. It takes its form in many ways. And the card, the divisive card most played is the card of racial divide. That you're encouraged to become part of a separate group and that separate group should hate another separate group. We will not fall for that. The opposite spirit of hatred is the love of God. We're going to move we're going to move in the opposite spirit, and this church will be a, a bastion, a reservoir for the love of God for all people who come here. Second evil of our generation, I believe, is the COVID-19 virus and the politicalization that has happened as a result of using that virus to engender fear in people and have people move by fear. Lockdowns to destroy our economy, destroy small business, isolating people, denying our children socialization and education, But I don't think the COVID-19 virus is the end of itself. Excuse me for saying this. I think it's a setup yes. for vaccines. I'm not going to belabor this. Go online and look up American frontline doctors and they will tell you about the vaccine. It is completely experimental. Anybody who tells you that vaccine is a cure for anything and they don't use the honest term experimental, they're deceiving you. They're lying to you. And these frontline doctors will say as soon as you take the vaccine, your immune system is reduced by 30%. Go look it up for yourself. Study it. If you've had the vaccine, I encourage you, don't take a second vaccine. Don't take the booster. Three, the evil of the day are on unconstitutional mandates and dictates to try to take your freedoms and your rights away from you, including your religious liberties. In California, the last year, we have had churches stand strong and we have had churches close. Because there is an attack on Jesus Christ as the head of the church because what is going on here has everything to do with the movement of the spirit of Antichrist. It is satanic. And it's to destroy the church. 
I thank God for the churches who have stood up, opened their doors, been strong. They've had to go to court, and both the Supreme Court of California and the United States has always found the church to be in the right and nobody but nobody has the right to tell you whether you can go to church or not how you can worship that is a divine sovereign right of God no man gave you that right and no man can take it away you can take it away from you but don't do that let's stand strong together yes number four we have seen the evil of the day in lawlessness, summer rioting, looting, violence, destruction, and the loss of property, the loss of businesses, and even murder in the streets. Did you ever think you would see that in America? I never did. But I'm ready for war. Five. There is a radical, extreme, far left, canceled culture movement towards socialism and Marxism and communism, and that is being pushed and sold in America. Now let me tell you, for every 100,000 people who may believe that socialism and Marxism might be okay, there's 10 million people who don't. We're in the majority. Don't trust what mainstream media, big tech, and the internet is allowing you to hear. You and I have been limited in what we're allowed to hear. Trust the gospel. Yes. Number six. The satanic move of inhumanity. The recent happenings in Afghanistan, and I will not belabor it, we have actually put Americans behind enemy lines to be slaughtered by terrorists. Yes. That's horrible. And our southern border is another example of inhumanity, trafficking children and women, enabling cartels and making them rich, and opening once again the floodgates of drugs. Yes. All this embolds the enemy and makes them stronger. Whether it's ISIS, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, they feel strengthened today more than ever before. Here's my great concern. That our White House and the State Department may be losing their soul. Jesus said, what would a man give in exchange for his very soul? Would gaining the whole world be worth it if you lost your very soul forever? And yet, I take a look at the decisions that are being made. Heartless, As though, as though people have lost their soul. Their conscience is broken. Their moral compass doesn't even exist. How can we do things? These things, how can we do these things to people? I fear for the soul of men and women today. <clears throat> 
And then finally, I think there's a satanic move to undermine and destroy the economy of America in efforts to defeat America and bring America into a one world government and economy. You and I, we drive the economic engine of our country. It's part of the greatest freedom that we have, that we can go to work, earn money, we can save it, spend it, invest it, but we have the freedom to do all of that. The free enterprise system, or capitalism, has been the most liberating financial force in the entire world. No economic system is even close. This is a divine gift from God that you have the freedom to work and to earn and to spend or save or invest. It's because of the free enterprise system that we can gain wealth through our ideas, our thoughts, our invention, our creativity. There was a day in order for a nation to advance financially that they had to go to war, defeat another country, and take their land from them. You know, that was a norm. That's most of history. We don't have to go to war in America. In fact, when America has gone to war, it's to fight for the freedoms of the world. And look what America has done when America has won a war. The horrible atrocities of the Hitler-driven German Nazi regime. America and our allies knocked that out and so what did we do? Claim their land? We put together a Marshall Plan to feed all of Europe, and we went in to rebuild a free Germany. Did we take Japan when we won? We didn't claim that land as our own. We could have, but we didn't. We're not imperialistic. All these people that are, are trying to preach to our kids that America is inherently evil. That's evil. Correct. America is the most blessed nation in the world. Because America blesses more nations in the world than any country in the history of mankind. We don't take their land we're not imperialistic. We go out of our way to build them back up after they've been our enemy. How good is that? That's inherently good. That's not inherently evil. Capitalism has freed more people and has avoided wars. What's the difference between this and this and this? It's the same paper. It's the same material. It took as much ink to make a $20 bill as it did to make a one dollar bill. What's the difference? The difference is your faith. The difference is what you believe. You believe that a one dollar bill is worth a hundred pennies. And you believe a five dollar bill is worth more and valued more than a one dollar bill and a $20 bill. 
is of greater value than a $5 bill or a $100 bill is of more value than all of them. But it's the same material, it's the same ink. The only thing different is what we, is the number we put on it. And if you, and if you lose your faith in this, and by the way, you may lose your faith in this, if we continue to print money recklessly, The day will come where everybody's got to pay their bills. And to print trillions of dollars needlessly is an attack on our economy. In Jesus' day, oh my goodness, okay. In Jesus' day, he taught Twelve disciples who became twelve apostles to change the world. I'm over the evils of our generation. Those are only seven. I'm, I'm over the evils. Now I'm going to focus for the rest of the fall. I'm going to focus on what Jesus did to teach twelve disciples 12 apostles to change the world and how he led them by example to overcome the evils of his day his day was full of evils says when the enemies come in like a flood there's a standard and Jesus in his gospel is the standard it says the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him him is Satan him is the devil him is the God of this world and he's totally defeatable Jesus begins his ministry with 40 days in a wilderness he's tempted to turn a rock into bread he's tempted to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple and he's tempted to worship the devil he responds to every temptation from the book of Deuteronomy man will not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God get the word of God in your heart because you'll have to speak it in the day of evil to hold you steady and to move you forward and I shall not tempt the Lord thy God he makes it a point you shall not tempt to God and then he says thou shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you worship that's all we bow our knee to one sovereign so his responses are a great example for us. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to close with this. Jesus, Jesus had to deal with the kingdoms of this world. The devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, plural, of this world and said, I'll give these to you if you'll just worship me. The first kingdom he had to deal with was Rome. There's always military might to deal with. There's always a bully on the block. There's always force and manipulation and power. And boy, did Rome rule with an iron fist. In fact, Rome occupied Israel when Jesus launched his ministry. Next week I'll go into a little more detail. But Rome disappeared. And Jesus and his church continues today. Secondly, he had to deal with the Herodian, the Herodians. 
These were the, this is the political force of the day. We have so much politics going on in America. Well, Jesus had politics in his day too. Herod just felt like all he had to do is befriend Rome, and the finances would be there, and if he played his cards politically correct, he could get what he wanted. We'll talk about that next week too. But the political forces are an evil kingdom all their own. And maybe there's no more evil than the religious kingdom of Jesus' day. Whether it was scribes, Pharisees, or Sadducees, they were the corporate, organized, institutional, hierarchical religion of the day. They had control over people and they used God to do it. And Jesus came down on that kingdom. The fourth kingdom he had to deal with were the Essenes. These were the people who were too high and mighty. These were the people that were too good. They saw what the scribes and Pharisees, they saw the religious system of the day, and they decided to disengage, go to Qumran. Um, actually, we get the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, from the Essenes. But, but, they, but they didn't help the situation. They detached themselves and became more of a, more of a part of the problem than the solution to the problem. And then, fifth, there were zealots of the day. That's a kingdom all of its own. They were violent, they were terrorist. The only dead, the only good Roman was a dead Roman. They were revolutionaries of their day. They were murderers, assassins, and they were bloodthirsty. Jesus didn't have an easy time overcoming the kingdoms of this world, but he did. And next week we're going to talk about how he did it and the example he gave to 12 men who turned the world upside down. And how the church today has survived and all these kingdoms have come and gone. Oh, they, they rise up in different ways. We still have force and power and people who want to go to war. We still have politicalization. We still have denominal, denominations and religion to deal with. But Jesus has raised up a standard. And so next week, I want to raise that standard for our church. <coughs> it's easy to follow. He made it easy. He empowered us with his spirit. He gave us his word. And he empowered us with his gospel, which is able to save even the most lost of people. Yes. I pray that those people that I mentioned who maybe have forfeited their soul, I pray that God can do the impossible and rescue their soul from hell. Amen. Yes. And we're here as a church to do that kind of work. Rabbi, would you close us in a final song?